thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for coming out for today's program. Uh, I wondered uh, when I was thinking ahead to this day uh, whether we'd have a crowd because we, we came last year and uh, told you about Austrian economics and its application to history. And so you've heard this before. You know, Maybe you wouldn't come this year. But, uh, <laughs> but we live in extraordinary, extraordinarily interesting times. Uh, uh, just looking through the Wall Street Journal at breakfast this morning, I, I was struck by how many major stories were there. You know, in uh, more normal times, you, you'd pick up the morning paper and you'd look, and there might be one thing that seemed to have some importance, and then a lot of other material of minor news events. But but now it's as if every day hell breaks loose, and, uh, and you think, what next? Uh, 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 it's really too interesting for me. I'm getting too old to, uh, to, to, to cope with this much excitement. And, uh, and I'd like to see it uh, calm down a little bit, but I, I don't think we can expect to see that uh, soon, unfortunately. Uh, uh, one of the things that has struck me after spending many years studying what happens during crises of this sort <clears throat> is that there's a pattern there's a logic to how they unfold, to how the state responds to uh, war, to uh, economic collapse, to uh, any kind of major threat. And uh, unfortunately, we are now in the midst of uh, the unfolding of another one of these patterns. And I'm sorry to report that so far it's going very much according to form. So. There's other bad news that will be uh, uh, coming uh, in, into play, uh, and I, I, I'm praying that uh, it won't be as bad as I fear it will be. Now, the, the title of my talk today, uh, Death Fuel, I, I, I can't take credit for. Uh, <laughs> Lou Rockwell, I believe, was the, the one who selected that, uh, that title. I'm... Uh, I, I, I'm not a uh, I'm not an inflammatory guy. I, I don't uh, <laughs> I, I don't choose uh, <laughs> uh, flamboyant titles like that, uh, and I go for the boring. And you'll see that soon enough. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyhow, death fuel uh, is an apt title. So I didn't uh, I didn't object when Lou gave it uh, that that title. Uh, now, death and taxes, uh, we're told, uh, are, are, are two unavoidable things. And uh, we're in a recession now. Times are hard, and uh, we're all looking for a bargain. So uh, I thought I could offer you two for one. Uh, what a deal. I'll give you death and taxes all rolled into one. Uh, which is to say war. War is my subject. Uh, you not only get death and taxes together, but you get uh, both of them in extraordinary amounts. So, such a deal. It's no wonder people keep going back for more time and again. Uh, I've, I've got a, an old friend, Larry Neal, who, uh, who taught for many years at the University of Illinois. He put together, about 10 years ago, a, uh, a documentary collection called War Finance. And uh, this was published uh, in some obscure uh, collection. And I'm, I'm sure that no one's ever looked at it, except maybe a few librarians who put it on the shelf. But it's an extremely interesting collection, three huge volumes, uh, probably 2,500 words altogether. Uh, I mean, uh, pages, 2,500 uh, pages. And uh, uh, what Larry did was bring together analyses by historians and economists of, of how wars have been paid for over the last couple of thousand years or so. And one of the things that just jumps out at you when you examine uh, these materials is that uh, the history of war and the history of taxation are virtually one and the same. 
uh, I, I find it hard to think of any innovation in taxation, any new form of taxation, any new way of collecting taxes that was not brought into being uh, as part of a government scheme to pay for a war. Wars uh, put governments to the test. Uh, and uh, when governments decide to go to war, unless it's a small war that can be fought out of military inventory, a government is in a position where it has to quite quickly transfer resources from their current uses and from the hands of uh, their co current possessors and owners into its own hands uh, for military uses direct or indirect. So war requires an abrupt uh, seizure, if you like, of resources by the state. And uh, that always creates a problem. Even if the public is generally inclined to favor uh, the, the war du jour, uh, nonetheless, uh, each individual tends to disfavor the seizure of his own uh, property. And uh, the more that's seized, the more people dislike it. Now, governments will always uh, raise regular taxes uh, when they go to war in a variety of ways in uh, major wars. Uh, they will raise old tax rates, uh, adopt new forms of taxation. Uh, but uh, whenever they do that, uh, they're always, as it were, creating tension or having to deal with the tension that exists between they being the taker and someone else suffering uh, by being the takee. So there's a, there's a kind of a conflict built into every episode of war and it's financed by the state. And uh, the government must find ways to, to overcome that uh, resistance and proceed uh, if it's going to undertake the war it intends to undertake. I'm going to um, focus today on what has been the most common way for government to deal with this problem or situation it confronts when it goes to war, uh, and that is to, to not only create new taxes and raise old tax rates, but to employ the most insidious of all forms of taxation, which is uh, the inflation tax. So when we look at the history of inflation, uh, again, it's the history of war. If you looked at a long graph of the general level of prices in the United States over the last uh, 250 years, you'd see, well, for a long time, basically a, a straight line with slow ups and downs. Uh, and then in the 20th century, a fairly smooth up, <laughs> upward sloping line as the, the dollar has been progressively uh, diminished in purchasing power. But, but imposed on those smooth long-term lines, you would see spikes from time to time. And every one of those spikes is a uh, war. Every one of them. There's never been a major inflation uh, comparable to the wartime spikes uh, at, at any other time in our history. So we know that, uh, that uh, death and taxes go together, which means uh, war and inflation go together. I'm going to show you some of the uh, evidence uh, I accumulated uh, on this subject uh, with regard to, to the two most outstanding uh, episodes in American history, the, the, the World Wars. Uh, they were both large-scale affairs in terms of the resources the, uh, the government seized uh, to carry out the war. Uh, 
Uh, World War I, of course, was the, the, by far the smaller of the two. But it was a big deal at the time. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a kind of simple rule of thumb, if you want to remember it, about uh, the costs of war in our history. Uh, go back to the war between the states, which, uh, which, which cost something in the neighborhood of $3 billion. And uh, that was an enormous undertaking at the time. And, uh, and, and is still the greatest uh, war in all of our history in terms of the number of deaths occasioned because uh, there were more than 600,000 deaths on the two sides in that war, and uh, that's a greater number of deaths than in any of the other U.S. wars. But in terms of uh, finances, uh, about $3 billion uh, for the Civil War. And then just multiply that by 10, and you get in the neighborhood of 30 billion dollars. That's a, roughly the cost of World War I. Actually, it's a little more, about 33. Uh, and then uh, if you go to World War II, multiply it by 10 again, so that you get somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 billion dollars for World War II. So, so it's as if there's, a, there's an exponential function at work here as we move from one major war to the next, that you, you can multiply the cost by a factor of 10. And uh, even recently, with the um, uh, relatively small-scale U.S. warfare in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, uh, the costs have been enormous, uh, considering uh, <laughs> that the number of men and uh, the amount of material and so forth is, is nothing like the scale of World War II, yet the government has managed to spend uh, in the neighborhood of Neighbor, neighborhood of a uh, uh, trillion dollars uh, already and uh, with no end in sight and uh, according to some estimates it, it considerably more than that because some of the costs are, are <clears throat> if you put them in present value terms for costs the government's going to be incurring in the future particularly caring for wounded uh, personnel uh, then they bulk up very very large indeed uh, but uh, at all events, World War I, which I'll start with, was a big deal at the time. Now, what you can see in, in this series of numbers, and if you can't see them easily in the back of the room, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what uh, I, I want you to get from them. Uh, first of all, you see that the, the federal outlays in that second column, uh, the federal government before World War I uh, never, never spent, uh, except during the war between the states, never spent uh, more, more, more than a billion dollars. And uh, so these, these figures are in millions of dollars, uh, or I'm sorry, billions of dollars here. Uh, and uh, so, you, so you see back here, uh, kind of a small scale federal government. In those days, federal spending amounted to something like uh, two, three percent of the gross domestic product. Uh, now when the U.S. begins to engage in the war in 1917 as an active belligerent, uh, the, the spending rises hugely, uh, very abruptly, and, uh, and as you can see, the, the big year is 1919 when the war is over because a lot of uh, the costs the government undertook to, to say, um, uh, purchase ships, uh, airplanes, and other things uh, involved projects that were not uh, complete at the time the war ended in November 1918, and so the government carried over a lot of purchases into the following year before it began to cut back. You'll also notice that when it did cut back, the level of government outlays in the 1920s was uh, in the neighborhood of around three, three billion dollars a year then, and uh, so it's r roughly three times what it was before the war. That's what I call the ratchet effect, or one illustration of the ratchet effect, uh, uh, so that even after the influence of the war had come and gone, the government ended up much bigger than it was before, and similarly with the level of taxation, as you see. But if you look here, the government is going to have to get uh, more than 20 times bigger uh, 
uh, here in a period of two to three years. How does it do that? <laughs> well, it, it raised taxes. You can see the, the federal taxes went up a great deal. Uh, they're, what, uh, six, seven times higher here by the time the war is over than they were before the war. Uh, so there was no doubt the government raised a lot of tax revenue. It, it did that in a variety of ways. It, uh, the, the federal income tax, you'll remember, was just uh, put into operation in 1913 after ratification of the 16th Amendment. And uh, so the income tax was available now. And uh, when, when, the, when the tax was first discussed, uh, before the law was passed in 1913, uh, of course, pe people worried, you know. They said, you know, this is going to turn out to be a way the government confiscates a lot of income. But its supporters said, no, 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 not to worry. Uh, this is just a way of making sure that the rich pay their fair share. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, the, the, the first income tax law in 1913, 14, 15, had rates that, that ran from 1% of taxable income up to a maximum of 7%. And 7%, well, maybe if you were uh, J.P. Morgan or Rockefeller, that, that was something you didn't sneeze at. But you almost had to be Rockefeller before you were subject to 7% tax rate uh, for the federal income tax in 1913. Uh, and about 98% of the people of the country didn't have to pay any federal income tax. So it did look like a tax on the rich. But once the government got into the war, the income tax was pushed down so that it applied to people with much lower incomes, and the rates were raised. In fact, they were raised so much that the top rate was pushed from 7% to 77%. <laughs> So then if you were a Rockefeller, you took notice. So it, it was nothing to sneeze at. But as you'll see, uh, despite this substantial increase in, in federal uh, receipts, which brought in about an additional $3 billion a year or more, the government didn't come close to meeting the increase in its outlays. So it had to borrow a huge amount of money. Now, if, if, if you want to go into the bond market and, and, and sell $20 billion worth of debt in 1917-18, you're, you're going to drive the bond price down real low and the interest rate way up. It's going to cost you a great deal to finance that war. So it behooves you to find a way to ease credit conditions. And that's where the <clears throat> new Federal Reserve System came into play. Also created in 1913, that most auspicious year, eh? ratification of the 16th Amendment, first federal income tax law of the modern era. Uh, there was a brief one in the Civil War era. And the creation of the Federal Reserve System in December 1913. So you've got two institutions there without which our history in the past uh, almost 100 years would be unthinkable. No income tax, no Fed. Uh, you cannot imagine our history without those two crucial state institutions. So we've got uh, We've got to ease credit, and the way it was done was that uh, the rules were changed uh, for the Fed and the banks. Uh, when the Fed was created, uh, a bank that wanted to borrow from the Fed had to have collateral, and it had to have commercial paper, basically. It had to have some business IOU, short term, usually 90 days or less, a very low risk form of uh, commercial obligation. Uh, and it could put that stuff up and borrow uh, temporary reserves from the Federal Reserve Bank. But during <clears throat> the war, the government changed the rules so that the banks could, could, could use U.S. government bonds as collateral. Well, that was handy uh, because the government was trying to sell a lot of U.S. government bonds. Uh, 
And so by that measure and by others, including by reducing the interest rate the Federal Reserve Bank's charge to commercial bank borrowers, uh, credit was made very easy. Uh, and a lot of that new credit that was infused into the banking system spilled over into the form of demand for U.S. government debt, allowing the government to finance its uh, expenditures uh, with, with uh, much lower interest rates than it would have otherwise had to pay. Now, the upshot of this is, of course, that the, the amount of banking reserves is rising, uh, and that is allowing the banking system to create a greater volume of money, and they're doing it. And you see that here in this column, uh, where the money stock increases between 1915 uh, and, and uh, 1920 by exa exactly 100% or almost exactly, close enough for government work. And uh, when you increase the money stock abruptly like that, you can expect that the general level of prices will be driven up in roughly equal proportion. And in this case, we have a textbook illustration of the quantity theory of money. Because if you look at the GDP deflator, which is the most general price index, you know, it's the price index for all goods and services being newly produced, what you see between 1915 uh, and 1920 is uh, precisely 100% <laughs> increase in the level of prices. So it's just a perfect fit for the quantity theory of money here uh, in World War One, you, you uh, double the money, you double the uh, the price level. This is a. Uh, consumer price index charted here, and what you see is this wartime increase showing up in the chart here is a, a doubling of the consumer price level and a little more. And then you see a post-war retrenchment, but the price level in the 1920s was much higher than it had been before the war, even with that uh, retrenchment. Now, World War II, as I've already mentioned, was a uh, much bigger economic event. There have been some increase, you'll notice, in federal receipts and outlays. By the time we get to the 1940 period, uh, the, that was the New Deal showing up there. But uh, the New Deal was small potatoes compared to World War II. And so what the government did here is move its outlays up by a factor of about 100 in five years' time. Imagine that. Imagine if the government did that today. <laughs> Increased its outlays by a factor of 100 in five years. Can you imagine that? It's unthinkable. Well, it was sort of unthinkable then, too. Uh, it's hard for people to swallow that that was even possible. Uh, but you have to remember what was being done. Uh, the, the armed forces of the United States in 1940, only about 300,000 men. And uh, five years later, it's more than 12 million in uniform. And a larger number than that employed either as civilians by the armed forces or working in war supply industries. So you, you reallocated approximately 40% of the entire labor force to war uses in five years' time. Unbelievable, a huge shift in the use of resources in the American economy. Never anything like it before or since. But how do you pay for this? How do you pay for this? Well, once again, taxes, 
You can raise the tax rates across the board. This time the top individual federal income tax rate went up to 95%. <laughs> yeah, it makes a millionaire not want to work that last day, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, you're going to give 95% uh, of that last million to the state. Uh, takes a lot of the incentive out of it. Uh, so taxes went up enormously. Uh, in 1943, the government uh, put into effect the withholding system uh, to make sure that it, it got money before people took it home and might not feel like handing it back to the government later. And that's something we've had ever since is the withholding system, another aspect of the ratchet effect. Okay? The institutional ratchets are often more important than the fiscal ratchets, by the way. Uh, but once again, the government finds that despite enormously increased taxation, its expenditures have gone up much more, and it has to pay for most of the war costs by borrowing. How is it going to do that without raising interest rates sky high? And the answer is, again, it's going to use the Federal Reserve System to create expansive uh, credit conditions. And in this case, it not only used the Fed to, to uh, lend to the banks and make money so easy that the banking system itself absorbed a huge amount of federal debt, but the Fed directly bought uh, something like $20 billion worth of U.S. government bonds, and that's, in effect, just printing money uh, without even the, the formality of going through the banking system. Uh, so the Fed enormously increased the money stock. If you look over here, you see uh, what happens here. Uh, by 1945, money stock has gone up uh, by about a hundred and, excuse me, by about, uh, what's it, $75 billion. So, huge increase. Now, you'll notice here in the price level I put up, because there was a lot of inflation as a result of this increase in money, uh, I've left most of these blank. And that's because any prices you, you purport to give for the war period are contaminated by the fact that the government put into effect comprehensive price controls. Now, when it did that, of course, <laughs> it meant that it was creating prices so low uh, in almost every market that there was excess demand for these goods. And, and they, they were no longer being rationed by the market price. Uh, they had to be rationed some other way. And so the government uh, put into effect a rationing system. Now, I brought with me today a ration book. Uh, this one was called Book Four. These are, these are blue-colored ration coupons. You had to have a certain stipulated number of these plus the money price when you bought any of the rationed goods. And so I have these because I think, you know, we may once again need them, and I'm going to be ready. Uh, 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 I'm running out of time, but I want to show you just one more display. Uh, these are... Um, uh, this is not, by the way, my uh, creation here, so don't blame this sentence up here on me. Uh, that's not how I would put it. But uh, this tells you the items that were rationed uh, in general terms and when they were rationed. Uh, there were a lot of variations, and what you'll see is that the, the, the rationing system was, uh, was generally discontinued uh, in 1945 for most of these goods after the war ended, uh, but the price controls persisted and uh, they were taken off for a short while in the middle of 1946, put back on again, and then finally after much hemming and hawing and politicking, uh, uh, removed for good, uh, except for uh, the a few like rent controls in some cities and a price control on sugar. Uh, 
but uh, but they lasted for the better part of the war. They made life very difficult for consumers, by the way, because every time you had to go to the store, you had to calculate whether you had the right number of ration coupons and whether you could afford to spend that number. At the same time, you were calculating the price and whether you could spend the money price and so forth. So this is just one of the difficulties. There's a myth that things were great during the war on the home front. It's a myth. Uh, and one of the reasons it's a myth is that this rationing system and the price control system made life very difficult along with many other changes that uh, affected uh, civilians and consumers when the government sucked more than 40% of the national income into making war. So you, you don't get something for nothing. The Keynesians have told us that World War II illustrated the Keynesian miracle. That's baloney. It did nothing of the sort. And the best way to see that is look what happened when the government cut back at the end of the war. The government dropped its, uh, its expenditures enormously in 1946 and 47. Every Keynesian theory predicted that would cause a relapse into the Great Depression. It did nothing of the sort. That should have discredited Keynesian macroeconomics once and for all by the very standard of mainstream economics. Empirical test. There was never a better test of Keynesian theory than that. It failed, and it went on living in academia right up to the present time. It's a very sad commentary on the intellectual honesty of mainstream economics. Thank you very much. Okay.